the reason I, I just changed my talk at the very last minute, the last two minutes, was to include an art, a, a, a small item of what I feel was rather untrustworthy communication uh, about statistics, which was which came out yesterday. If you look at the um, winter plan that's been made, this is the website giving us all our instructions for the, for the winter, and their figure one looks like that. That's what they put up as figure one. Now. I don't think that is a great graph, to be honest. You know, you could say it's difficult to tell which country is which. You might ask, why did they choose those countries? Where's Germany? And so on. And, uh, and crucially, is this a linear or a logarithmic scale? I asked on Twitter yesterday, and it's about equal the vote so far on whether this shows this is linear or logarithmic. So um, I think, you know, we could do this as a poll if we wanted, but we shouldn't have to do this as a poll. We should be told. Someone's made this graph and has stripped out what they thought was extraneous detail, which included what the axes actually meant. And the crucial thing is then, where is the, um, you know, or, you know the, the choice of countries, but crucially, you know, the axis, is this linear or logarithmic? You know, answers on a postcard, please. Um, I can't, I'm not sure, and I, I shouldn't, but we shouldn't have to decide. Okay, so I make a point in, in the title and elsewhere of talking about trust and trustworthiness. And from that, I'm inspired by this wonderful professor, Honora O'Neill, a philosopher of Kant. And she said that organizations should not be trying to be trusted. And, you know, we all want to be trusted. No, she says that's the wrong thing. What you should try to do is demonstrate trustworthiness. And it seems to me this is the crucial issue, is, is the communication being trustworthy, particularly about data? And that's what I'd like to explore. Now, it's very important that the, the Code of Practice of Statistics for this country, which is not actually riveting reading at all, um, you know, its first pillar is trustworthiness. And um, that, I think that's, that's incredibly important. You know, this is, I think, Honora O'Neill's influence, that what we're looking for is trustworthy communication. And um, well, this is our Centre for Risk and Evidence Communication, I, I'm chair of in Cambridge, largely psychologists and communication professionals and web designers. And um, just last week, we came up with a, um, an article in Nature for trustworthy evidence communication. It's freely available. It's just a, it's a commentary. Um, this is the board of the of the centre, and we got five rules that I now try to promote all the time about if you are a communicator of data or evidence, what you try should be trying to do. The first thing is informing rather than persuading, and that's not a decision you have to make yourself. With, you have to have clarity of motive. You want to understand why am I doing this? Why am I just trying to manipulate people to do what I want them to or think how I want them to? In which case, fine, but that's not a trustworthy communication, that's advertising or marketing. Um, and then a balance, meaning you take into account everyone's concerns, the positives and negatives, the, the winners and losers, but not false balance. You don't pretend they're all of equal size. Crucially, disclose the uncertainties, and we're going to come back to that. And also, and this is a trickier aspect, and we'll come to this later, be open about the limitations and the quality of the underlying evidence. I feel very strongly about this. And the one that I, I like is the pre-bunking misinformation, that we, we can't just be passive communicators. We have to listen to people's concerns and we have to be ready for the misinformation and get in there hard and early. Don't wait to be on the back foot when all sorts of nonsense starts being spouted. Get in there, say why it's wrong, and, and this is a proven tactic to counter misinformation. So don't we're not we're not just sort of passive and nice if 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 people are saying misinformation or active disinformation we've got to get in there and correct it first okay so it's been a busy time over this period for communication i, I just in summary i think that the national statistics the office for national statistics public health england have generally done an amazing job of getting the stats out the professionals have i think been extremely good Huge demand from the media for comments from experts just coming in all the time. Um, I've, I've been very lucky to work with the Science Media Centre, which deserves a medal for the fantastic work they've done throughout this whole crisis. Cannot believe the huge benefit to the country that we've had by having an organisation that acts as a conduit between the scientists and the media. They ran a press briefing yesterday for the Oxford vaccine. There are just are so many journalists on it. And it's, it's extraordinary that, that we are so fortunate to have such an organisation. I think most journalists have acted well. I'm going to show some other examples, but on the whole. 
But as a, as a as someone who does joins this fray to some extent, it is quite tricky to remain non-aligned. You're constantly being pulled to one of oh, you're either you're for lockdown or, or or you're against lockdown. No, no, I'm not for lockdown or I'm against. I'm not against. I'm not. I'm on neither side. I'm not. I, you know, that's not what I do. So it's constant need to say that's not what I do. That's not what I know about. I'm going to stick to try to stick to my area of expertise. It's so tempting to get pulled out of it. Okay, um, I, I must, you know, give reference to more or less, which has done a fantastic job at communicating statistics and uh, items of data throughout this whole crisis. Um, just looking at Office for National Statistics. Now, I've got a conflict of interest. I'm now halfway through the pandemic. I was made a, a non-executive director for the uh, UK Stats Authority, which oversees the work of the Office for National Statistics and the Office for Statistics Regulation. So I've got a vested interest. So but it's, I'm not just saying they've done a brilliant job um, because of because of that. I thought they had a brilliant, were doing a, a really good job anyway. I mean, there's always improvements they can make, and it's just not absolutely perfect, but they really have stepped up to the mark. And this is the kind of data that they're showing every week, which I feel is very valuable. If you look at you know the total number of deaths in England and Wales, look at the five-year average, is things going up and down. This is just because of um, bank holidays and so on, because it's registered dates, not. Date, actual date of death. And very interesting what's happening now. Um, a small deficit in non COVID deaths, but pretty well all the excess deaths are COVID in this, which is not the case here, although this is probably largely under diagnosis. We might note that there was some deficit in, in deaths over the, over the summer, but not as many as you might have expected had you believed the people who said, oh, all these people are, would have died anyway a little bit early. It's just brought their deaths forward. A few months. No, this obviously clearly didn't. It brought their deaths forward. I mean, all deaths are deaths brought forward, but it brought their deaths forward more than just a few months. So just looking at that, that graph tells you a huge amount. Okay, but all is not normal, you know, is going on. We haven't got, we can say, well, non COVID deaths are roughly normal. Well, they're not if you look at the place in which people die. And this is this whole idea of drilling down through data that you know that you can look at a, an over a, a top level story that might you might think one thing. But when you drill down, which we always should do, you can get a different picture and realize, oh, there is, there are unusual aspects here. And what we're saying here is that deaths at home are carrying on, they're 40% above normal at the moment, no sign of declining. These are not COVID at all. These haven't been COVID deaths almost at all. Um, and so we're, you know, this is a major change in the practice of death in, in this country. And, um, you know, who knows what's going on? You know, are these good quality? Are these people getting good end of life care, etc.? There's so much that's important about looking at this, the basic top level statistics, which only drive the need for better data and to be able to drill down even further. And of course, you, we go around that cycle again and again and again. The data never answers everything. It just provokes more questions. Um, I, like, I look at this every day, the, uh, the Public Health England dashboard. Um, I th it's got better and better and better. It's now got an API. You know, People can download all the data and create their own apps and do all their graphs. Amazing what people produce within minutes of the data going online at about 4 o'clock every day. Um, it is quite extraordinary. I mean, it's, it, and also it highlights when you go through it, it highlights the, the day of the test being taken and the day of the death rather than the report date, which is what goes up on the news every day, but is grossly misleading. I know tomorrow's Tuesday, there'll be a lot of deaths reported. So, you know, I just know it. So you shouldn't take any notice of the number of deaths reported tomorrow. Um, the other nice thing, of course, is being able to drill down. This is yesterday, what it was showing me about rates in Cambridge. I, I am now here, right on this dot, and I can see, um, you, you know, usually it's, it's, it's gone down a bit. It, this was high, this was um, very high for a bit in, in Cambridge, but it's come down um, since the beginning of term, uh, the rates in Cambridge have come down. So I can get this a really quite a nice local level, which is good. Can't get graphs on it, which is a shame off the PHE dashboard, but still pretty good job. Um, availability of data, because we all love data, we all love transparency, it can have unintended consequences. Um, <laughs> this was a, a tweet from last week with Toby Young, who, who he, you know, he looked at the data and said that, you know, there's been 5 million Britons have had coronavirus, all this nice data, 50,000 people have died from it. That means infection fatality rate of 0.1%. No, that's 1%. No, he got it wrong. 
by you know an order of magnitude. That's roughly the same as seasonal flu, which is what he's been saying all the time. Now he has now shown himself up to be both you know um, technically, you know, mathematically incompetent, and you know had his whole argument that he's been making for ages that it's no worse than flu completely destroyed by his own reasoning. It won't change his mind, I'm sure. So there's the sort of nonsense that we get out, the sort of misinformation that we have to counter hard. Okay, but then you get things like this. This was in the, in the Neil O'Brien, very good to highlight this in the Daily Mail this week, showing that fatalities, are, that unlike the picture I just showed, which showed excess deaths from ONS, claiming, oh, there's no excess deaths compared with maximum deaths over the last five years. Well, actually, no. You know, where did this come from? You know, if you look at the ONS data, that's what the ONS data shows, that our current number of deaths is higher than the maximum they've been, considerably higher than the maximum they've been over the last five years, last five years. So where did this come from? Well, we look down the bottom, we find that this is ONS data, but it's adjusted for population growth produced by statistics guy, who's a sort of anti-lockdown campaigner who tweets and produces some graphs, makes some a really strange adjustment for population growth that nobody can make out. And then the Daily Mail reproduces graph and stick it up in the, in the newspaper. I mean, this is terrible. This is really awful that, you know, just because somebody can produce a graph means it gets getting this sort of media coverage. So there is this, you know, side effect of making data available. There's no reason not to do it. We just have to be ready to counter this, this sort of misinformation. Okay, so I've been making some attempts at communication, not very successful most of the time. I wrote this paper in the British Medical Journal about using normal risk as, a, as, a, as an analogy to communicate the risk to individuals of getting COVID and dying. So this is the death rates, catching it and then dying. I, I, I don't know if you've seen these graphs. I find this most extraordinary graph, which is just, it's very simple. It's just from ONS data. And it just looks at the death rates um, per 10, per 100,000 people in the different age groups for women and men and compares it with the normal risk over this period that people have got. And um, I mean, it's difficult to tell on the natural scale, but on the logarithmic scale, you get these extraordinary straight lines that goes all the way from 95, essentially, to, to seven years, seven, 10 years old. And um, it's amazing, really, that this this virus hates age. It, it really punishes age. You know, the risks increase 12 to 13% for every year you're older. It's a 10,000 fold difference in risk between elderly, average elderly person here and average young person here. Very difficult to communicate that enormous gradient. And I thought the only way we could communicate that was making an analogy with normal risk because the uh, above 50, they're almost parallel. So the increase in risk per, per year extra age is roughly parallels normal risk. Unfortunately, nobody understands what their normal risk is. I mean, nobody has any idea about what the average risk of dying this year is for people their age. And so that is quite tricky. Um, well, I, I thought that one way to do it was to say that over the 16 weeks of the peak, it was like if you're over 50s, you experienced an extra five extra weeks. So you experienced 21 weeks of risk rather than 16 uh, weeks of risk. And nobody ever seemed to understand that or get it at all. So I thought it was a real shame. You could say also it's as if the whole population above 50 was temporarily four years older <laughs> over the epidemic. You know, you could put this in this perspective. I don't think that would have worked either. We don't have tried that one. Um, what about the chance of dying if you catch it? So this is another effort I made to use analogy with normal risk, again, with um, considerable failure. Uh, you know, this was back in March. This is the classic imperial paper that was published on March the 16th and had such an impact. And they estimated the infection fatality rate, which has been so disputed ever since, as Toby Young's tweet shows goes on even now. And um, I noticed, uh, prompted by somebody who t was on Twitter, that, that this was, um, uh, you know, really quite similar to the underlying risk of dying this year on average. Um, and so I claimed back in March, if you caught COVID, the risk was roughly the same as the risk of dying this year from other causes. This was taken up by the BBC, promoted on their website and things like that, just hopelessly misunderstood because I didn't make this clear enough. So this graph the BBC produced, Katie Hopkins, bless her, before she was banned from Twitter, tweeted out to her million followers 
that corona deaths are not outpacing what is normal or usual. Graph from me. No, no, that's not what I meant. I didn't mean these lines go along here. It doesn't mean that this doesn't add to the normal risk. It means it doubles the normal risk. No, I didn't make that clear. So the Sun had the headline, your risk of dying is no different this year despite coronavirus pandemic, says expert, you know, me. And I got it changed. I spent my time shout, phoning up and emailing journalists to get headlines changed. And normally they do. I did just two days ago, I got one changed. And, and um, they, they're really quite good, partly because the journalist doesn't write the headline. And so they just have to um, get it changed. OK, um, what's extraordinary is that uh, recently the same group did a new estimate of the infection fatality rate by age based on 200,000 deaths now. The first one had just been based on Diamond Princess and some data from China. This is based on 200,000 deaths from nine, 10 countries. And look at that. Whoa. I mean, just bang on the, no, the average and annual risk of dying. Isn't that extraordinary? That, um, and so I think we can say, and even you know, other evidence suggests that, broadly speaking, this is true at a more individual level, that if you are ill, your risk of dying this year, if you get COVID, if you're vulnerable, is roughly the same as the risk of dying this year anyway. So it doubles your risk of dying this year, which I think puts things in perspective. Again, mm, people have no idea about the risks of dying this year. People have no idea of actuarial risk. So in a sense, I think I failed on this one. Okay, let's talk a bit about reasonable worst case scenarios because they have featured rather a lot. Um, and it's a particular bugbear I've got about the communication of data. Um, and we could look at, um, for example, right back at the beginning, this is back in March. I don't know about you, I stopped shaking hands on March the 3rd was my, um, my first little intervention. Um, and uh, back then we were getting headlines, um, coronavirus could kill half a million Britons. So this was this 500,000 figure that was produced by, by modelers, you know, basically, you know, really quite simple assumptions about if we did absolutely nothing, this is what might happen. Well, we're not gonna do absolutely nothing, are we? However, that worst case scenario, I don't know how reasonable it is, um, you know, then got promoted as this is what could happen. And then of course, um, we got this graph back in, in mid-September, um, which was put up at a press briefing showing that if um, cases uh, increased, doubled every week, if this is what it would look like, we'd get 49,000 new cases reported. This is not true cases, this is reported on, 13, on um, you know, uh, 13th of October. And in fact, there were 17,000 17, reported. Now, this is the kind of thing, you no, know, it's not a project prediction, it's a, it's a scenario, but it's only one scenario. And then of course, we got this ghastly thing um, on October the 31st at the uh, briefing that, that was announcing the new lockdown. Um, that, and there was a real mess. This was never intended to be shown uh, as part of a public document. Um, it, was, it was outdated even by twice by the time it was shown. All the attention was just on this 4,000 a day. Um, they say these represent scenarios, not predictions or forecasts, and yet brought you know wholesale derision, I think, on on the, the material being presented at that at that uh, meeting. It only encourages the lockdown skeptics. I think. I'm, I'm not pro or anti lockdown, I should say, but you know I am against people who misuse evidence. Um, and then this was wheeled out again to a parliament to parliament when they when it, this was discussed the following Wednesday. Now this is really bad practice. This is not trustworthy communication at all. Um, it, it, reasonable worst case scenarios, you know, I think do have a role. You know, they're used in the National Risk Register, um, which is interesting. You know, there's pandemics. This is the standard. This is likelihood of occurring in the next five years. No labels on the axes. Impact severity. No labels on that either. Pretty ghastly communication. Um, but that was pandemic, sorry. This is the one we're interested in. This is emerging infectious diseases. This is what we're living through at the moment. And we noticed that it was considered not unlikely, but low, moderate impact. A couple of hundred, few hundred deaths was, was considered. And this seems to have, you know, I think had an impact in the planning because this was their assumption. This is their, their scenario that they were planning for. Actually, at least the National Security Risk Assessment, which is classified, but part of it was leaked, um, and did allow huge uncertainty about what that was. So again, it's the focus on a single scenario rather than the range of possibilities, I think that is so dangerous. 
And so um, I, I would argue that communicating a single scenario, whether it's a good case or a worse case, is actually a manipulative way of communicating because it's only showing one picture. This is not showing balance. This is not informing. This is trying to persuade people to, to make us anxious. Any use of scenarios should show multiple scenarios, multiple possible futures under different uh, you know, things that might occur. So let's, uh, just to finish off, I'd like to talk about uncertainty. I've already said a lot that part of demonstrating trustworthiness is admitting uncertainty about what we know. Um, it could be a range about a number, and our research strongly shows that if you are unapologetic about your uncertainty and give a range, there's no decrease in trust in the source of that information. Um, or this other aspect, which I introduced earlier, an acknowledgement of the limited quality of the evidence. And this, I think, is something that is um, you know, can be overlooked, although clearly people do think it's important, both the producers and the consumers of data. So, you know, we, uncertainty is not just putting error bars on. That is not adequate communication of uncertainty. And I'd like to demonstrate that um, with an example. Um, now, this, in a way, is I think is quite good practice. It's good practice that we're seeing it. Um, this is SpyM's uh, communication of um, a, a little while ago, of the different estimates of R being made by eight different modeling groups in the country. They're using, they are using different data, some data, but basically, you know, very similar data they're using, but very different models and producing quite a range of estimates. They're all broadly, you know, in a range, saying R is between one and two, but, you know, they're actually showing quite a range and also they're very precise. These intervals don't even overlap. <laughs> So they can't be right. <laughs> they can't all be right. Some of them might be right, and but they can't all be right. In other words, they're, they're, it's too precise. They're, they're measuring, so in a sense, the internal precision, assuming the measurement process is correct, assuming the model is correct. But all models are wrong, particularly some of these, which are always gross simplifications of what's going on. So I would feel that, you know, these are then put together in a slightly subjective way, I believe, to produce an overall estimate, and that's quite reasonable. Imagine if you were a decision maker and you only got one of these. Whoa, you know, that's not, you know, trustworthy communication. Again, showing them all is much better. But I think it acknowledges that when we're communicating our results, we should make clear what the assumptions are. And the assumptions here is that the models are correct, and we know they're not. Um, other, you know, the acknowledgement of the, our belief in the, our confidence in our whole analysis, in the whole basis for our claims, um, is being made much more explicit now in different quarters. And I'd like to point to the wonderful work of the UK What Work Centres. If you look at the Education Endowment Foundation, you may have seen this before. This is a toolkit they produce. You can find this online. And it looks at different educational interventions, different policies that teachers might use. And it looks at them. It's like TripAdvisor. It star rates them in terms of their cost, in terms of what impact they may have in terms of months of educational advancement, and crucially, in terms of the strength of the evidence. So aspiration interventions is quite expensive, doesn't seem to work, and the evidence is rubbish anyway. OK, so that's fine. We can deal with that one pretty quickly. Um, collaborative learning, on the other hand, pretty cheap, seems to have an impact, and there's reasonably good evidence. So, I mean, this seems to be extreme. I, I like, really like this as, as communication of evidence. Um, SAGE are doing this. SAGE, when they're making their um, communicating about the impact of different interventions, are both commu communicating when they can arrange an interval, but also their confidence in the evidence. So, face coverings outdoors, very low impact, high confidence. There's no point in wearing a mask outdoors. So, they're pretty confident about that conclusion. But cl closure of places, worship, community centers, well, it might have some effect on R up to 0.1, not sure, only moderate evidence and confidence. And for things like hairdressers, whatever, it's low confidence in their conclusions about the impact. So I think this is, this is really good communication and, um, and uh, is, a, is a great thing to do. Okay, just to finish off then, all I can say is be careful speaking to the media. <laughs> I do it quite a lot. I continually make mistakes. I continually regret what I've done. Um, uh, this was a nice one, though. I'm quite pleased about this one. On, I was on the Today program at 8.30 last week discussing possible Christmas rules. 
is not something I would want to do particularly. So I was doing it in a fairly lighthearted way. And I said that raised voices could spread the virus. And I, I did think, and it still could be the possibility that when we get the rules coming out on, for Christmas, that singing indoors might be banned, quite reasonable. But then I said, well, it's, if you're going to ban that, you might as well say ban family arguments because those could really spread the virus. So what happens, this was a joke. Um, I don't think they're going to do that. Um, but the next day, well, actually not the next day, within an hour, there's, there's the lovely headline in the Daily Express. Christmas warning families could be banned from arguing to prevent COVID spread according to a leading British statistician. Isn't that delightful? That's, well, that is what I regard as a result, um, even though it was rather unintended. Okay, so with that, I'm going to stop and hope I've left time. Apologize deeply for my staggering incompetence at the beginning and um, in front of so many people and hope I've left time for some questions. Oh, I have, great. Okay, so I'm, I'm very willing to try to answer questions. So. Thank you very much, and please forgive me my um, little mental lapse. Not at all, David. That was absolutely fantastic, as always. Um, and I think we are equally, as, if not more, to blame for the technical lapse here. I think we're all still figuring out how to do things in the COVID era. So I hope everyone will forgive us as they have in the comments. But I've got several questions, and cool. I want to try and get through as many of them as possible um, so yeah. we can give the audience answers to things they're interested in. So I'm going to kick right off and say that was excellent. And question number one is, <laughs> how do you feel or can I tempt you into giving us an answer about how you feel about science by press release? Um, and I'll delve in a second into what you make of the effectiveness claims that have come around the vaccines. But I think science by press release more generally is something that we've had to deal with um, that maybe we wouldn't have tolerated a year oh. ago. But it's I a way that information has got out there. So I'm going to throw it to you, you're shaking your head. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. I, it is a terribly important question. We, we are doing things that, you know, a year ago, we would have thought were completely unacceptable. Um, you know, everything going on preprint servers automatically, um, which again, the vast amount that goes on preprint servers, unless there were press releases, nobody would see it at all. Nobody would be taking any notice of this stuff at all. So I don't think the preprint server itself, although, you know, it's a, it is such a, um, such a negative thing uh, because it does make the work accessible and it could uh, you know encourage pre-publication review or whatever it's the press release accompanying a preprint it's gone up there um, is is I think where the problem is um, and I think that is a problem we've had some real rubbish put up there and being press released and um, and also we put some, that's a really good stuff being put up there and be press released um, so the, it means that the media, who normally at least have a bit of a filter, are getting almost no filter between what they're, what they're getting, what they're receiving. I, when I say before they only had a bit of a filter, they still, and I, we, I used to complain about this no end when working with the Science Media Centre, there were still, you know, conferences would press release posters, they'd press release all sorts of stuff. But, you know, we'd finally got it through to press officers that, you know, peer reviewed and, you know, essentially was an important issue. Well, that's gone now. You know, that's just disappeared um, for, for COVID uh, science publication. So there is, um, I think there is an, an issue there. It means everyone's got to be far more beware of what they, what they read or the media has to be far more aware. It emphasizes even more the role of the Science Media Center, which acts as this sort of conduit and enables criticism to be um, communicated to the, to the, um, uh, you know, to, 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 you know, to the media. But again, that kind of relies also on embargoed press releases because then at least the criticism can get out there at the same time as they get out to the journalists before they're writing the story. Um, so it's, you know, it's turned into the Wild West and, um, it's going to be interesting, and I'm not going to predict what will happen as a consequence as we all calm down a little bit. Um, I, th th there has been some extremely good journalism, I think. And, and again, all I can say is that it's, it's shown the absolutely uh, essential nature of um, filters like the Science Media Centre that can at least provide some critique. The vaccines is a slightly different matter because these were pre-planned analyses. They, they do have to follow the protocol that's there. And, um, you know, they, and they do have to announce their results because they are so commercially um, important as well. Um, so 
it, it, and you know, as I said, the the Oxford one came out with the press release, uh, but they also did the press briefing yesterday, where they, you know, all the developers just exposed themselves to, you know, uh, to the entire press core, which I think is wonderful transparency in terms of the communication of the results. And so, um, I, it, the, the, they're different. It's not just um, a uniform thing. There's some really good stuff that's been come out very fast, quite rightly, because of the um, collapse in the normal systems. And there's also been some complete rubbish. And, um, and so it's meant we've all had to become a bit more aware with our filters. Fair enough. And I, and I think that that's a nice way to look at, uh, or maybe leads me into my second question to be more appropriate. Um, I consider myself a, a jobbing academic. I imagine that a few hundred of the participants would also give themselves that label. And because we're now living in a world where things are going up onto preprint servers, uh, university comms offices seem to be so much more willing to press release pretty much anything these days. Uh, not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing. What do I and what are the professionals that are listening to you today? What's the one thing we can do when we leave here to make sure that we're falling on the right side of history? in how our work is perceived and making sure that we aren't misleading people. Is there something useful we can do or do we just need to well, learn? I, I, what I'd say, what I would have said all the time is work really closely. Take your, um, your publicity campaign very seriously indeed and pay serious attention to it. I say that, I, I'd say that if you're really interested in media coverage of your work, you should have um, uh, engaged with the media beforehand. You don't wait until the stuff's ready and then find out, oh, I need to talk to a journalist. You should ideally have primed some journalists to know some journalists, to work through other members of the team who, who are familiar with the media and make sure it's, you're ready for that story. Um, and, and secondly, you work, you work with your comms team. You don't just hand it over to them to write a press, press officer. You have to take responsibility. If there is misleading stuff comes out in a press release, you are responsible for it as much as the press officer who did it. You need to take control of that and make sure you are an integral part of that communications. I think that you know these big teams, and you know there's uh, that have been working all these fantastic scientific work that's been done. I really think that their the, their communication has to be taken seriously. Ideally, they would nominate one person in that team, pretty senior, but a, but a good communicator, someone who's been trained and could do it to act as the as the front end, as the communicator, to get out there, talk to the press engage with the, with the media and so on, and not just bunker down and complain about it when people misunderstand things. So you've got to be proactive, take it seriously, get out there and engage. Fair enough. And this next one I'm going to read out because I think that it's been very nicely phrased by Eleanor. So wherever you are, thanks for this. <laughs> Is it possible for organizations to build trusts around sensitive topics? where there are legal concerns or other constraints which make it impossible to share as much concrete information as we'd like to? Yeah, I, that's a very good question, of course, because you want to build, you know, uh, and I think, again, I go back to Anora Neal, who wrote a lot about transparency and trust. And, and she said, transparency isn't about going, blah, you know, what you know, people call fishbowl transparency, just showing everything to everybody. That's not transparency. What you have to, the, you know, the intelligent transparency means, um, you know, it doesn't mean just revealing everything to everybody. You know, it, it means curating what you do show, but essentially her steps are that you should make when, you, when you're communicating in order to demonstrate trustworthiness, uh, lovely four steps, these, these are cool, these are cool, worth remembering. Um, you've got to make the, the information assess, uh, accessible, so people have got to be able to find it. That's a lot easier now. It's got to, make, it's got to be um, uh, comprehensible. You have to check that people can understand it and, and test it. Test it with your aunt, is what I say, um, your non-numerate, non-scientific aunt. And then, and then you've got to make sure it's usable. It actually addresses people's concerns. That that you are, you have listened. You know what people are concerned about, whether you're of your work. And then finally, you've got to make it accessible. If other people do want to actually check the working to some extent, not with the complete. You can't. Doesn't mean you're going to necessarily show everything. Not every. You know, ideally, you'd show your code. Your, your code would be available. All that kind of stuff. And that obviously is what we should be aspiring to. But there are situations where you can't show everything. However, people should be able to assess the basic, um, you know, transparent honesty of what you are communicating. They need to be given 
the um, the reassurance that you that you are acting in a trustworthy way. Most people won't want to check; they'll just take it on trust. So I, I think this is very this is really important. Trustworthiness, transparency is not about showing everybody everything, because in the end we have to take we have to take things on trust. We we just have to trust. We can't live in a society where we don't trust. But what it what but in order to demonstrate trustworthiness, you should, in a way, open yourself up. You know, have some you know open yourself up to critique and question. So I want to go off into two directions, but I'll pick the first one because you've just mentioned the word trustworthy communication. And again, this question comes from our audience. There, there's this issue of language where we sometimes say something and we mean something very different. And the example that's been used is that of confidence intervals. No. Um, we're not at all confident in what the interval is. Uh, in fact, they're just some sort of vague idea of our uncertainty. And is there something that we can do around the language we use that might be misleading people unintentionally? Yeah, I, 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 well, I mean, the first thing, of course, never use the term confidence interval and never use the word p-value or statistical significance or, or any of these things. So, you know, they're completely banned from all communication. So, I mean, that's part of the comprehensible stuff. You've got to make sure you're not just trying to impress people with jargon. You've got to cut all of that stuff out. And as I showed with these estimates of R, which are all these are great teams. I'm, I'm no criticism of the work they're doing, but those intervals are on their own, do not represent the uncertainty. And I think that has to be part of the communication to somehow show, okay, I'm estimating this, but this is conditional on the assumptions of the model. They're, they you know actually, and the model is, is wrong. And that's why this extra measure, we, we call it direct and indirect uncertainty. Direct uncertainty is when you can put a range around something. You know, a nice little interval. But actually, do you believe that interval? Well, I don't most of the time. When people claim an interval, I don't believe that interval. I don't believe that fully expresses the uncertainty. So the indirect uncertainty is when we have to say, well, difficult to put into numbers, but actually we know the data is not very good. It's a bit biased. Our model is very simple and so on. Difficult to say what that means in terms of an interval, but we do know that, um, you know, we've got. Um, you know, we're cautious about our conclusions, not just, and that's not expressed just by the interval. So we have to have a more subtle, I think, sophisticated way of communicating uncertainties, not just putting a range on things, because I don't believe the range. So I, I, I think that um, I, we do have to be careful, careful about that. But again, what I say, our, our research suggests that if you do do it and you're upfront about it, it does not necessarily lose trust. We, our research does have a suggestion that if you actually admit that all your you've got low confidence in your analysis and you think your data is rubbish, then trust can go down. But I think I think I'm quite right that it should. <laughs> Fair enough. And I think I will ask you one last question uh, on everyone's favourite topic, which is, what's your take on Twitter and the role that Twitter has played in communication of science? Generally positive, generally negative. Uh, could you do without it? No, no, I completely rely on it. It's my main form of getting information and of communicating at the moment. And um, my followers have just shot up. I, think I started off at 15,000, now I'm at 67,000 or something like that. So I've done very well out of it over this, um, over this period. And I learn a lot of it. But you have to take it with a pinch of salt. I mean, I'm very free at muting people. I don't, I don't even block them. I don't even want them to know that I'm not I'm not taking notice of them. So I just mute people. If people are, you know, because people can be, I, I can't stand, you know, actually I can be a bit critical myself, of course. I mean, I wasn't very generous to Toby Young, for example. So, you know, in a way I'm not, I'm not some perfect, you know, um, gentle person, but I don't like rudeness and I don't like people being nasty to me. I'm a sensitive soul. And so if someone's rude or impolite and nasty, I just block them or, or, or mute them. I don't want to see it. I just don't want to see it. So you don't have to, you don't have to <laughs> listen to these people. <laughs> so there's actually, but I, if I do try to follow people who I don't agree with um, in order to find out what's going on. So reasonable, there are reasonable people I just, I don't agree with at all. And I want to find out what's going on, but there's a lot of people I just don't want to have anything to do with. Um, so in a way you could just say, that's my little bubble, um, but we have to filter out. We don't want to, be, you know, I don't want to every morning, every day, look at the nastiness. And, and misinformation. 
God, there's a lot of crap out there. You know, oh, all the tests are false positive. There's not going to be any second wave. There's huge immunity in the population. You know, this is all just a case demic. It's what a load of old, you know, I won't say the rude word. And it's all out there being propagated by people. Um, and uh, and I, you know, sometimes I, bo I bother to attack them. Sometimes I don't. And um, it's it really is disturbing the, the amount of stuff that, and they get huge amounts of followers and views and videos. And I think, well, actually, it's very difficult to do anything about that. However, I still, as I mentioned right at the beginning, we have to know the misinformation. We have to know what's being said in order to counter it. Not, I can give up a lot of a lot of people. I just give up. It's hopeless. Um, but in terms of the sort of people in between people who might be pushed one way or another, then we have to get out there, you know, with the flag of truth and righteousness and, and say, this is wrong. You know, people will say, oh, I mean, the real nutcases will say vaccines are all, you know, injecting Bill Gates is putting chips into us and all that sort of stuff. So there's that wing, but we, which we hardly have to bother with. But there will be a lot of other stuff that people are saying that sounds more reasonable and that, again, we have to counter. Um, so I think we, we are not passive observers. If we just sit and complain about stuff that's being said, we're not doing our job. We have to get out there and counter it.